Hello, all views worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG. Here with another episode of Ask Dave. Today's question comes from patron Dennis Monty. And he says, could you do a tutorial on the antenna building? Specifically, what is the difference between reflectors and directors? How they function and how to determine their size and spacing? Well, my goodness, books have been written on that various subject. In fact, one of the best books on antennas comes from the ARRL. It's the ARRL Antenna Book. Now, I think in its 24th edition or something like that. You can get it direct from the league. It's also available on Amazon as well. Okay, what I will do here um, is just take a quick surface swim uh, with Yagi antennas, and we'll see what we can learn. So before we jump into this, I want to say a special thank you to Roy Gerdig, who's a longtime patron of mine. Uh, he helps every month by putting a little bit of money into patron, and that money becomes part of the channel funds and helps keep the channel going. You too can become a patron by going to patreon.com slash ke0og and pick a method that works for you. So, let's see what we can do to address this question. The Yagi antenna was developed by two Japanese. A guy by the name of Yagi and a guy by the name of Uda. This was the lab assistant, this was the professor, so he got all the, the fame from it, but the two of them are the ones who created this antenna. And it was done in the 1920s. That is a hundred years ago. It's been around for a long time. Now, what Professor Yagi did was he took a dipole. And we're looking down on this from the top, okay? So this is a plan view. And there's a mast. Um, I'm sorry. There's a boom. And the boom has the reflector mounted on it and one or more directors. Now this is in essence a dipole and this is the element that is fed. We put uh, some kind of a match. Remember a, um, a dipole that's center fed. We're going to need to do something to make it work. Now one way that you can do to make it work is to feed it like this with there being a capacitor in here, okay? This is called a gamma match. Okay, that's one way of doing it where this right here is connected straight through. If you break it, which you can, right here you can just feed each side. You probably want an, a ballon here because you want to feed this absolutely beautifully. Now what happens is, as the wave radiates from here, okay, in this direction, it hits the reflector. And a good portion of that wave is reflected back. In other words, these are called parasitic elements because they get their energy by being a parasite on the main fed antenna. Okay, this is the reflector, and it's on the order of 5% longer than the driven element. This is the driven element. Okay, now, the directors... Um, are about 5% shorter, okay? And then these are all the same length going, and you can add as many as you want. Now what happens is this will give you a strong beam in this direction. If you look at the top, the beam is out there like this, and you'll have little tiny side lobes. It looks sort of like a dirigible, okay? Now, the spacing of these things was always assumed for many, many years to have to be uniform. 
and so you could get close spaced or wide spaced, but um, the spacing was uniform. Recent computer modeling, and I, by recent I'm talking about in the last 20 years, has discovered that the optimum Yagi does not have uniform spacing between these, these pieces here. And so the newer antennas, you can still buy the old, old uh, antennas like the, the A3 from uh, it's either Cushcraft or uh, High Gain. But they have three elements, okay? You can get them with four elements. Getting a HF beam with more than four elements is, is hard, okay? They, they get wobbly. You've got a problem. Is your, um, your mast, which comes out of the top of the tower, is going to hit it in the middle of its center of gravity, remembering that this element's going to weigh more than these elements out here. It's fed in its center of gravity. So the cable will come up here. It'll come out along the boom. This is the boom. And it will connect there and be the driven element. Now, because it is so directional, now I'm going to draw a slightly smaller scale. Okay, you've got a tower. So these things like to be high in the air. You have in here a shelf, and on this is a motor, and this is the tower. This is the mast, and no, it's not as crooked as my 71-year-old hands make it. And then you have the boom, and you have the elements on top of this. Okay, and then this right here is a rotator, and it turns it to the direction that you want, okay? So here's your driven element. These are parasitic elements. If you have a water table, you can actually build some of these, like in a physics classroom, and watch the waves in the water pond go out. But these waves are bounced off here, which then go this direction, and it tends to focus the beam. That's why these are often called beams in one direction. Again, with minor side lobes, and then the one direction like that. And then if you look at it from the side, the elevation angle is fairly low. You've got your little side lobes and stuff down here. So this is your elevation angle. Note that even though these are dead flat, the elevation angle goes up like this. Now I'm gonna tell you something that happens if you put this antenna more than a half wavelength in the air. Suppose you're more than a half wavelength in the air, you're going to get a split in the vertical pattern. And if you go high enough, you get that split all the way, and you'll end up with lobing. This is called lobing, where it's divided into lobes. I know a lot of people like to get their Yaggies up to 100 feet with a very expensive tower, but you're going to have a lot of lobing on all the ham radio frequencies. So what do you do about that? Well, it is possible to mount a ring around the tower, put the boom on this little ring, and have a complicated mechanical connection to turn this in different directions. So you've got one here and one here, and even if this is lobing, the lobes are in different directions, okay? And that way you can switch back and forth between antennas. This is expensive enough this is really expensive. Okay, for a tower. I once got a quote from a tower company that does cell towers and stuff like that for a tower and a mast, the rotator and everything, but not the antenna, for I think it was about $30,000. 
Obviously, you're going to be wanting to do a lot of this yourself. There's got to be a foundation. Sometimes the tower manufacturer will tell you how to do the foundation, and you probably need to have the plans inspected by your local building official. In our community, I gave some um, testimony to the local planning commission, and they set up basically a 35-foot tower which is a common size, um, is almost automatically approved. If you go above that, you've got to worry. Note that if the tower is higher than 200 feet, you've got to coordinate with the FAA and they'll make you put lights on it. Okay, and as a pilot myself, I would highly encourage you to put those lights on there. I don't want to hit that thing. Okay, so there's your quick and dirty introduction to Yaggies. This is a concept that um, oh, it, people who've been generals for quite a while or amateur extras for quite a while might have the ability to put a tower up. There's a lot of things you can do to reduce the cost of the tower. I recommend that you get new tower if you can because you won't have the problems with corrosion. You've got the same problem as a uh, chain link fence, it's galvanized, okay? It's steel and it's galvanized to keep it from rusting. If you somebody's trying to sell you an old piece of tower that's got any rust on it, politely decline. Uh, you don't want rust on a tower. There's gotta be a concrete base. Um, there are freestanding towers. There are towers that are guide. Uh, the whole tower community, which is mostly cell phone towers, are moving toward self-supported unguide towers. Now in Florida, you have to build what's called a Florida tower. It has to be able to withstand about 130 mile an hour wind. So this can get expensive. Then you've got the, all the attachments for the rotor. Rotors can be over $1,000. Um, and that goes up on yet another piece of metal, which is the mast. And then there's the antenna itself. The antenna itself, of course, all antennas are sold as kits. So that means that you have to put the thing together. It could take you two or three days to do this. If I were you, I'd get help. Uh, with some friends, whatever. And then when you do go to the mounting, um, you'll probably want to get some experts there to guide you. There are people who climb towers for a living and they make very good money, as you might imagine. Uh, and every so often you hear about one whose career is cut short by an accident. It's very dangerous to get on a tower. If you are my age, you wouldn't do it. Just don't do it. Get somebody else to do it. Putting a tower up is a classic project for a club. If you've been a member of the club for a while, you know the guys and you want to put up a tower, you can just have a tower raising party and go out there and get that thing put up. And the people who are really good, the tower monkeys, will go up and get everything set. Oft times they'll use uh, lift, tool lifts, these big lifts that they use to get transformers up to power poles and stuff. They'll use something like that. Um, and you rent these by the day and you can go up and, and do your installation. So there you have it. Can you make a Yagi differently? Yes, you can. I have what's called a hex beam. A hex beam is a two-element Yagi built in the shape of a um, hex. It's got six sides. And that's what I use for my gain antenna. It gives me about uh, an S unit over um, a normal dipole or vertical antenna. And I've got it. I, I put it up to test it when MFJ sent it to me to test, and it's been up ever since. It's a quasi-permanent structure, although it's designed to be portable and movable. So, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that. If you've followed this video this far, 
and you've enjoyed it, I ask you to subscribe and click the bell. Also, if you'd like to help support this channel financially, you can do that by going to decastlercom slash support. And there are several options there waiting for you uh, from very little to if you want to contribute a little more. Uh, also, a one-time tip if you just want to contribute once. So there you have it. Until we next meet, 73.